Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Dear students, you are welcome in this class. The topic of this lecture is yield potential of crops and cropping systems and their relationship with soil fertility. So, learning objectives are to get acquainted with terminology relating to the crops, cropping systems, learn the influence of interaction of cropping systems and soil fertility on the yield potential of crops. Glossary that is some difficult words crop growth requirements, needs of an individual crop or cultivar for an appropriate development and yield. Plant growth requires a reasonable moisture and nutrient supply linked to a sufficient rooting depth and to a proper energy regime for photosynthesis and biomass production. Cropping system, the cropping patterns used on a farm and their interaction with farm resources, other farm enterprises and available technology which determine their cultivation. The cropping system is a, is a subsystem of a farming system. In farming system, this crops or crop management is an, an integral part. Fellow system and agricultural system with an alteration between a cropping period of several years and a fellow period with natural fellow vegetation. Here fellow means not taking any crop. Just just keeping the land unused, that is fallow. Monoculture, the repetitive growing of the same soil crop on the same field, year after year, continuously for many years, that is monoculture. Multiple cropping, growing of two or more crops on the same field in a year. The concept of multiple cropping includes cropping practices where soil or mixed crops are growing in sequence simultaneously or simultaneously or with an overlapping period. So, we will know in detail what is multiple cropping and what are different types of multiple cropping. Overlapping cropping system, it refers to crops with briefly overlapping growing periods and overlap which lasts for the whole cultivation period. For example, if annual or biennial plants are planted into a stand of perennial plants. So, overlapping cropping system mainly happens when your present crop is harvested, but before the harvest of this crop, the other crop is sown. It is also some places called as utera cultivation. For example, in Madhya Pradesh, Odisha, Chhattisgarh and in some other parts, what people do harvest uh, before harvesting of the rice, they broadcast seed of lentil or some other pulses or oil seed like linseed. And then after 10, 15 day, days, crop is harvested and by that time the legume or oil seed crop which was broadcast will get well established in the field. So, it is practiced. Potential yield. The maximum realizable yield that can be achieved by a given crop cultivar in a given area based on radiation and temperature means when your uh, growth factors are not limited whether biotic or abiotic, plant is getting the best environment. So, yield obtained under, under those conditions is your potential yield, maximum possible yield. Return cropping, two or more crops are taken consecutively from a stand. Significant return crops are sugarcane or sorghum. Return cropping is a form of sequential cropping. Now, cropping system. What do we mean by cropping system? Principles and practices of cropping and their interaction with farm resources, technology, aerial and edaphic environment to suit the needs and production strategy. It is an important component of farming system. Now, what are the characteristics of a good cropping system? Maintains an adequate level of production and income. 
the cropping system will be uh, sustainable when it is able to provide sufficient income to the farmer and it also gives you continuously a good yield or good potential of the yield is realized then we can say that it is a good cropping system minimizes economic risk and provide for pest control there can be number of risk like failure of the crop due to drought or flood there may be attack of insect pests and diseases so in this case the cropping system which gives you minimum risk minimum minimum risk of insect pests and disease that is a better system that is a good cropping system maintains organic matter and good chemical physical and biological environment of the soil for sustaining the productivity continuously the natural resources particularly soil should not be over uh, exploited or degraded so cropping system which maintains your soil physical chemical and biological health will be preferred by the farmer or will be a good cropping system because these physical properties uh, like your soil texture soil structure water holding capacity they are very very important for uh, sustaining the growth of the crops and productivity of the crop there are two kind of cropping systems monoculture cropping system and multiple uh, cropping systems so let us see in detail what do we mean by them what are the advantages and disadvantages or demerits of these two cropping systems monoculture the repetitive growing of the sole crop on the same piece of land that is your monoculture it has got certain advantages like it fits crops to soil a particular crop when it is grown continuously in one kind of soil so that uh, crop fits very well in that particular soil good marketing because uh, you are continuously growing a crop particularly based upon the demand in the locality or in that area so uh, marketing infrastructure is already established for those kind of crops see the case of basmati rice in punjab and haryana where marketing services or marketing infrastructure is very well available people are ready to buy basmati immediately and they have also got very well established uh, rice mills are there so infrastructure is there so under these conditions farmer will prefer basmati rice so good marketing also decides the crop lower machinery cost because you have just one kind of crop year after year so same kind of machinery can be used in all the crops or farmers buy machinery as per need of the crop if you have two three crops then you may need two three different kind of machinery particularly for harvesting operations or weeding etc now of course uh, it has got more disadvantages than the advantages so disadvantages of monoculture are increased risk of diseases because you are continuously growing one kind of crop so pathogens insect pests disease uh, are their survival propagues all sorts of things they get permanently established in the field or in the soil so which can easily come next year so they are getting the same host year after year so under these conditions you will get severe insect pests and disease attacks increase weed pressure it has been observed that you if you continuously grow rice wheat rice wheat rice wheat then you will get more incidence of felris minor and some other weeds so monoculture also promotes uh, more weeds increased economic risk you have just one crop and any calamity or natural calamity or any natural problem happens then the whole area or whole crop will be damaged otherwise if you had 2 3 or 4 or more different crops then this risk would have been minimized so under monoculture conditions you have more economic risk and soil fertility problems are many because every year you are taking same crop that means the depth the rooting depth of that particular crop will be the same so only that particular layer of the soil will be exhausted of the nutrient and lower nutrients uh, will remain unutilized so this is very serious issue from the soil fertility point of view and also a particular crop may love to extract one or two particular nutrients in larger amounts 
so that way your soil will be depleted in that particular nutrient so considering the dis disadvantages of monoculture people started a multiple cropping system and also they had in mind some economic consideration or profitability that is why they like multiple cropping system multiple sometimes it is also called as multi crop or multi cropping systems the general term is growing two or more different crops on the same field in a year that is multiple cropping system so advantages are like spread economic risk so here you have two three different kind of crops in a year so if any problem come to one crop and it is killed uh, killed or destroyed then at least you will have some other crops to recover the economic losses they crop they may be two three other crops also reduce incidence of insect pest and disease so here you follow certain rotation some mix cropping intercropping kind of things then definitely the uh, in insect pest damage is less because you are adopting rotations and you are not getting the same host every time and also many times you grow crops of different families where insect pest disease problems may be different so therefore the uh, incidence of insect pest and diseases is less if you follow multiple cropping better weed control it has been observed that if you include leguminous crops in the rotation or as an intercrop then definitely the weed weeds are suppressed the weed growth is less so therefore multiple cropping have several benefits spread economic risk reduce incidence of insect pest disease and of course better weed control it has got some demerits or limitations or disadvantages also like the systems are more complex and little understood because at same time farmers have to manage two three four different kind of crops so it is knowledge intensive system and many times it becomes complex because you need to apply certain inputs inputs on cropping system basis you have applied certain quantity of nutrients in first crop you do not know how much has been used and how much uh, is left for the next crop so some complexities are there in the multiple cropping systems in many actual economic systems not considered to be economically efficient so it is also a limitation of the multiple cropping system and greater need for hand labor so in this case because you have variety of crops and they need different operations so labor intensive system is there there is shortage of trained personnel and general lack of knowledge or understanding so these are the some minor uh, disadvantages or demerits otherwise if rainfall is there conditions are there farmers like to grow two three crops monoculture has happened in areas where only one crop is possible so that is by nature not by choice now this uh, multiple cropping can be divided into two sequential cropping system and intercropping system so we'll see one by one sequential cropping as the name suggests that it is in sequence so growing two or more crops in a sequence on the same field in a year that is your sequential cropping so succeeding crop is planted after the harvest of the preceding crop crop intensification is in time uh, time dimension in this case sequential cropping in intercom uh, crop competition no intercrop competition or intercom competition intercommunity competition is not there because at one point of time you are growing only one crop so there is no inter intercommunity competition in this case farmers manage only one crop at a time now other is intercropping one is sequential cropping and other is intercropping so growing two or more dissimilar crops simultaneously on the same piece of land in a distinct row arrangement so here why we adopt uh, intercropping to get some extra yield and to use the space as well as time so when you get some widely spaced crop like sugar cane and maybe uh, maize or cotton etc uh, there are wider spaces between these uh, the two rows of the crop so you can utilize that particular free space 
for growing a short duration crop in between the two rows that is known as intercropping so in this case you can take uh, in cotton you can take uh, black gram or green gram similarly in maize you can take black gram green gram in sugar cane particularly autumn planted sugar cane people take mustard people take uh, potato and some even chickpea i have seen so these are the intercropping system if you have uh, sugar cane in spring season then you can grow uh, uh, mung bean as an intercrop so there are options and people are adopting some sort of intercropping systems but the optimum plant population of base crop is combined with appropriate population of intercrop under most of the conditions these are in additive series not in replacement series so you get extra rows of intercrop but the base crop uh, plant population is normally the same intensification of cropping system is both in time and space so this is the advantage now intercropping can be of different types here i am discussing four different kind of intercropping systems the number one is mixed intercropping so growing component crops simultaneously with no distinct row arrangement here means you can plant the first crop one crop in rows and seed of second crop can be broadcast row intercropping growing component crops simultaneously in different row arrangement so this is the example just i gave you sugarcane plus uh, chickpea or like this strip intercropping growing component crops in different strips wide enough to permit independent cultivation so in this case suppose you get four or five strips of one crop then four or five uh, strips of another crop means uh, you get four or five uh, rows of for example wheat and then you can have four or five rows of mustard so like this in strips you are growing intercrops relay intercropping uh, growing component crops in relay so that growing cycle overlap so this is also no known as overlap intercropping system where the succeeding crop is sown before harvest of the preceding crop so in this case normally there is no requirement for the tillage mixed cropping growing two or more crops simultaneously on the same piece of land either sown after the seeds of the crop intended to be grown mixed or sowing alternate rows in various replacement ratios so this is your mixed cropping now see major cropping systems in india so just have uh, some knowledge of this so you can see rice wheat is, is the most dominant cropping system and you can see in the map area where you get this system light green color shows in north of uh, northwest india starting from punjab haryana uttar pradesh uh, bihar and then uh, bengal uh, it goes up to bengal so you can see this rice wheat system is the most uh, dominant system and then you see rice rice system it is also dark green color you can see it is most in eastern india this rice rice system or up to some uh, maybe in uh, coastal belts also and this purple color cotton wheat system it is mostly in central india you can see cotton wheat system and then soybean wheat system also in central india and maize wheat system you can see it is in north india and palm millet wheat system it is confined to western india mostly in rajasthan you can see in the picture so uh, they are distributed in different states so for example rice wheat system occupies about 10 million hectare area 9.85 million hectares and it is uh, west bengal up gujarat punjab haryana mp j and k himachal pradesh bihar maharashtra and assam then rice rice system comes it is kind of monoculture and you have 5.89 million hectare area the next highest area andhra pradesh kerala tamil nadu assam orissa uh, gujarat and karnataka then rice fallow system it is also there rice fallow occupies very large area which is uh, 4.42 means your second crop is not taken only rice is taken here so jharkhand karnataka uh, madhya pradesh jammu kashmir and maharashtra fallow gram 
fallow gram means in kharif season you do not take any crop and then in winter or rabi season you take gram or chickpea 2.4 million hectare and most common in madhya pradesh then rajasthan haryana and up fallow wheat it is also in madhya pradesh and up area is 2 million hectare so fallow wheat actually it is grown on residual moisture and wheat is mostly grown as rain fed crop in madhya pradesh maize wheat 1.86 in punjab jammu kashmir himachal pradesh haryana bihar up then so uh, then palm millet wheat of course it has 2.26 million hectare area in rajasthan haryana and up maharashtra soybean wheat 2.23 and uh, most common in madhya pradesh rajasthan maharashtra uh, soybean fallow 1.17 madhya pradesh rajasthan maharashtra rice groundnut 1.02 tamil nadu maharashtra ap odisha sugarcane and ratoon wheat 0.97 and other uh, system like cotton wheat 1 million hectare in punjab rajasthan haryana and then other uh, um, minor cropping systems are cotton fallow fallow sorghum fallow mustard palm millet mustard rice lathyrus rice vegetable etc so see variety of cropping systems are there in the country and they differ from one region to another region the first factor of difference is caused by the rainfall the areas where you you get more rainfall the crops like rice are dominating areas where you la uh, lack rainfall oil seed pulses are are dominating or up to some extent wheat is also there in rain fed areas now what conditions determine that a particular system will be applicable in a locality so there are certain determinants that decides that this cropping system can be adopted here or why a particular cropping system has been followed in a particular place so factor like soil and climate will determine the uh, cropping system so soil means uh, it is not that one crop can succeed in all kind of soils a particular preference is there for every crop for example rice prefers heavy textured soils and certain pulses and other crops they pre pre prefer medium textured soils and certain crops prefer light textured soils so according to soil properties also the crops are decided the ph of the soil if it is too high or more than 8 then you need to take uh, crops which are tolerant to high ph or similarly low ph so we we need to take into consideration the soil properties when we see uh, the cropping system climate climate includes your temperature your rainfall or your weather conditions relative humidity sunshine hours so they also determine the cropping system for example if you have high temperature hotter climate then you can have crops which can tolerate it similarly in cooler climate you cannot grow a crop of a tropical or subtropical part so this climate also decide the kind of crop that will be successful in a particular area or region socio economic factors are also important in india we get certain economics also because the economic status of farmers are different some crops require very intensive input like vegetables or certain high value crops require high quantity and high money for the inputs so not every farmer can do it it is only rich farmer who can afford these inputs so economics also decides the kind of crop and cropping system and social issues are also there for example in punjab there may be good uh, good crop of tobacco can be grown but uh, in punjab uh, many uh, farmers local farmers uh, considering the religious issue and they will not grow tobacco in punjab crop varieties uh, and the, if the high yielding crop varieties are available for a particular crop then definitely it will be preferred by the farmers if good varieties under one particular crop are not available then that crop may not be adopted by the farmers so availability of crop varieties and seed also determines the kind of cropping system that could be followed in a locality 
soil health we need to look into the soil health issues also sometimes farmers see that a nutrient exploiting crop who who removes large quantities of nutrient requirement of nutrient is also high and soil health can be affected so therefore they may choose certain legumes or certain oil seeds which can restore the fertility also which do not over exploit the soil fertility pest environment if a particular pest is dominating in a particular area on a particular crop then that kind of crop may not be adopted by the farmers and they will be disenchanted to to grow that particular crop water resources of course are the most important factor that determine the cropping system based upon the availability of the water farmers select the crop so if they think that water availability is not there then they will never grow rice so and also government policies also help in determination of the cropping system now you may consider that rice wheat system is most dominant system in punjab and haryana so why it is dominant besides so many reason one reason is that government buy uh, buy their uh, their rice and wheat at minimum support prices so not much problem is there in getting good or remunerative prices so therefore farmers still stick to rice wheat cropping system now in india any any crop or any cropping system we are not uh, able to realize the highest possible yield our yields are very very low productivity is very very low across the crops and across the cropping system that is a major concern for all people for farmers for researchers and for government also so here we will look into the uh, what is yield potential and what is what are different gaps yield gaps and what are the reasons why our cropping systems or crops are yielding low so let us uh, see yield gaps and yield potential yield gaps are estimated by different difference between yield potential and average farmers yield over some specified special and temporal scale of interest so yield gaps are easy to identify first you take the average average of all farmers yield in a region and also see the, at the yield at say research station or some other uh, other centers and then compare the difference in the yield that will be your yield gap and yield potential is the yield of an adapted crop variety or hybrid when grown under favorable conditions without growth limitations from water nutrients pest or disease etc so yield potential of a crop in a particular environment is the maximum possible yield when no input or no any uh, restrictions or any problems or limitations are there so this is uh, the full possible yield you can consider so by definition yield potential in is an idealized state in which a crop grows without any biophysical limitations other than uncontrollable factors such as solar radiation air temperature and rainfall in rain fed system uh, crop yield gaps so how what are the percentage of gaps in india how much we we could achieve and what what is left to be achieved so you can see india's recent accomplishments in crop yields while being impressive are still just 30 to 60% in mean, suppose 100 units of yield are possible but we are harvesting or we are achieving only 30 to 60 percent that means 60 to 70 percent gap is there so big gap is there we can fill fill this gap uh, best yields achievable in the farms of developed as well as other developing countries so we are way behind way behind than china way behind than even many asian countries so additionally despite these gains in farm productivity losses after harvest due to poor infrastructure and unorganized retail cause india to experience some of the highest food losses in the world we are losing a lot of uh, food in india particularly post harvest losses are there and after post harvest losses we do not have good and efficient storage facility so lot of food is wasted in uh, wasted in storage in punjab and haryana i have seen that wheat and rice are stored in the open 
for months and then rainfall comes and the wheat and rice get rotten. So we need to think on this storage facility. And then it is habit of many rich people to leave lot of food on the plates. So that wastage should also be avoided. Additionally, despite these gains in farm productivity, losses after harvest are mainly due to poor infrastructure or storage and unorganized retail cars in India to experience some of the highest food losses. Now see agricultural productivity in India, growth in average yields from 1970 to 2010 in kilogram per hectare. So you can see growth uh, in 1970, 71, 1990, 91, 2010, 11 and 9, 2019. So you can see for rice, it was a steady increase, not very big jump. So in 10 years, in the first 10 years, 70, 71 to 1991. Rather, 20 years, we could uh, get from 11.23 kg to 17.40 kg. The raise increase was very, very slow. Again, in next uh, 20 years, you can see from 17.40 to 20, uh, 20, uh, 240, 2,240 kg. Again, in 20 years, we, we could not increase much. And then from uh, 20 to 40 to 4,000. Of course, here the change was uh, higher, but still we are much uh, way behind than other countries. Similarly, in wheat also, you can see for pulses. For pulses, it's, it's very deplorable conditions here up to 2019. You can see in pulses, in 20 years, uh, uh, 1970, 71, it was 524 kg per hectare productivity. And then in 20 years, we could not increase much. It's just 578, then 689 in next 20 years. So now even it has declined. So you can see the scenario in pulses. We could not achieve higher productivity. Oil seeds also uh, almost same story. Sugar cane is, is still better. The improvement in productivity. Tea is also not doing so good. So you can see in most of the conditions except few, maybe wheat or up to some extent wheat is good. And, but in most of the conditions, we could not uh, increase the productivity at a faster rate. So although India has attained self-sufficiency in food staples, the productivity of its farm is below that of Brazil, US, France and other nations. Indian wheat farms, for example, produce about a third of the wheat per hectare compared to farmers' farms in France, means uh, the productivity of wheat in France is three times that of India. So we get big gap is there. Rice productivity in India was less than half that of China. So it is, it is really, very, um, we must think on this, that China's productivity of rice is double than India's. So gap is there. Other staples productivity in India is similarly low. See the case of rice, even Bangladesh, our neighbor, has more productivity than India for rice productivity in terms of coarse paddy. So you can see uh, for uh, India, first you see for India, it is 3.79, 3.85, 3.96, 4.06, is starting from 2016 to 2019. So in 2019, India's coarse rice productivity was 4.06 tons per hectare or 4,060 kg per hectare, which is less than even Bangladesh productivity. You see. In Bangladesh, they are getting 4.74 tons. So they are, they are ahead us. And see the case of China, almost three tons more than India. In China, you get seven tons. In India, you get four tons. So three tons more. Lot of gap is there in rice productivity of India and China. And see, Indonesia has more than India. Japan have very good productivity. And see the last column is Australia. Australia has highest productivity of rice in the world, 8.77 uh, and say 10 tons, 9 tons, 10 tons. If you take the average of Australia's productivity of rice for last four years, then it may be somewhere around 9.3 or 9.4 tons per hectare, more than double, more than double of uh, India. So we can see that we are, we are not able to achieve good productivity not in rice, in many other crops also. So Indian total factor productivity growth remains 
below 2 percent annum. In contrast, China's total factor productivity growth is about 6 percent, three times. So even though China also has small holding farmers, several studies suggest India could eradicate its hunger and malnutrition and be a major source of food for the world if we are able to achieve the or realize the higher productivity or if we can bridge this gap. So by contrast, Indian farms in some regions pose the best yield of uh, sugarcane, cassava and tea. So it is not uh, very disappointing picture. Some positive side, side is also there. So in sugarcane, we got good scope, good improvement in productivity. Crop yields vary significantly between Indian states. Some states produce two to three times more grain per acre and then others. So these differences in yield gap also based upon the region. For one crop, one particular state may give you more productivity than other. So the traditional regions of high agricultural productivity in India are northwest, mainly Punjab, Haryana and western UP. And besides that, certain coastal districts on both coasts, West Bengal and Tamil Nadu. So these are the areas of higher agricultural productivity. See the case of productivity of milled rice in Indian states. So you can see the uh, yield, yield in different years, 2014, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17 and so on. And latest data is 2018, 19. So see the last column, Andhra Pradesh 3.73. Then Assam, one ton less, more than one ton less than Andhra Pradesh. It is 2.15 tons in Assam. And as you see, Bihar, very low productivity, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat. And now you see Punjab, it has 4.13 tons per hectare, which is double of Assam. Uh, of course, Assam is traditional rice growing area. And Punjab is not the traditional rice growing area. But productivity of Punjab is double of Assam. So state variability is also there. See Tamil Nadu, very good productivity, 3.56. And Telangana, again good, 3.45. So these productivity basically depend upon irrigation. So in Punjab and in Andhra Pradesh, in Telangana, uh, rice is almost 100% irrigated. That is the reason. Or in Bihar or Gujarat or in many other parts, the irrigated area is comparatively less. Crop yields for some farms in India are within 90% of the best achieved yields by farms in developed countries such as US and European Union. So in some places it, it is not that bad, we have achieved up to 90%, but that is very small fraction. No single state of India is the best in every crop. So now you see again some disparity in states in achieving the potential yield. So comparison of average yield and yield potentials in various studies. So in northern India, on an average, the wheat yield is 3 tons per hectare. Yield potential is 7.5 and we are harvesting less than this. So uh, uh, yield gap is 4.5 tons, which is 40 percent, means gap of 40 percent is there in whole northern India for wheat. And in Uttar Pradesh, it is 50 percent, in Punjab, 75 percent, uh, and in 75 percent have been achieved. This is achieved of the potential. And then Madhya Pradesh, 57, Rajasthan, 60, and Gujarat, 89 percent, Maharashtra, 44. These data are from different studies. See the case of rice in Philippines, 40 percent realization. In Philippines, dry season 43. West Bengal, India 67 percent, that is good figure. And Tamil Nadu 64 percent. But in Bihar, it is 36 percent. So realization of actual uh, potential yield varies with the state also. Now see potential, and that was mostly for rice, wheat, and other crops. Now see what is the situation in dry land areas. Potential of rain fed and dry land agriculture. So this data is from Rock Storm 2007 observed yield gap for major grains between farmer's yield and achievable yield. So you can see how much uh, we are achieving observed yield gap percentage. So in Tanzania, it is 32 percent, 35 percent. And likewise, you can see for different countries and you can see for India also. So in India, we achieved only 40 to 45 percent of the potential yield. This data suggests. So 
lot of his gap is there, scope is there in dry land. So in dry land, this gap is wide than the irrigated lands. Yield gap of important rain-fed and dry land crops in different countries. So you can see, just see the data for India, how much is the gap. This black color is your potential yield or potential yield possible and gray color is the actual yield what we are getting. So you can see under most of the cases hardly 50 percent have been achieved on an average 40 to 50 percent have been achieved and remaining is the gap. So gap, gap is larger in dry land rain fed areas compared to the irrigated areas. See the yield gaps in dry land crops, national demonstration blue color bars and national average is uh, this red color bar. So you can see national the gap in national average and national or best yields. Best yields are blue and this red one are actual yields. So you can see the lot of gap is existing for cereals whether in kharif or rabi, millets, pulses, edible oil seeds. So you just see the gap is there. So many irrig irrigated cropping systems including maize in the United States, wheat in South Asia and Mexico and rice in Japan, Korea have yields at or approaching 80 percent. In, in most of the cases, uh, in uh, best uh, yields are 80 percent. This implies that yield gains in these regions will be small in future and yields may even decline if yield potential is, is reduced, particularly due to climate change. Many rain-fed coping systems, in contrast, appear to have relatively large yield gaps that could be close with existing technologies, but persist largely for economic reasons. Now, why this yield gap is there? Let us analyze some reasons. Yield gaps occur due to factors like physical factors. There may be problems such as poor water management, drought, flash floods, and temperature stresses. Now, many climatic factors, when they come in adverse, then they can uh, reduce the yields. Biophysical factors like varieties, seeds, weeds, insect pest disease due to inadequate crop management and post harvest losses. So biophysical factors are there and you please try to analyze yourself that how these biophysical factors are affecting the yield gap. Socioeconomic factors, labor shortage, cost benefit farmers, uh, knowledge, skills and welfare conditions. Institutional factors like government policies, rise, uh, price, agriculture credit, input supply, land tenure, and agricultural research and extension, etc. govern. So these are actually limitations. If we can overcome some of these limitations, then we can narrow down this gap or we can bridge the gap. So factor contributing to yield loss, it was estimated by Ramasamy 1996. How many kilograms of yield per hectare will be reduced by these factors in South India. So just you see the list, uh, the column number one, that these are the major factors that can reduce yield of rice in South India, like scarcity of irrigation water, drought, cold temperature at anthesis, lodging, low light intensity, soil salinity, low fertility, zinc deficiency, all these factors are causing reduction in yield. In different state it is different, but the main message here is that the yield is getting declined due to uh, these factors. Acidity soil, soil acidity, alkalinity, iron toxicity, weeds, imbalance of uh, use of fertilizers, uh, aged seedlings, varietal problems and socio-economic factor. Overall you can see these factors have declined the yield. So what uh, common factors that contribute to yield losses in farmer feed. Some general factors that were particularly related to rice. Now see some general factors that uh, reduce the yield. Uh, see biophysical factors like nutrient deficiency and imbalances. Number two, water stresses, flooding, suboptimal planting, soil problems, salinity, alkalinity, weed pressures, insect damage disease, lodging and inferior seed quality. So many of these factors are in the control of the farmer. If they get good money, if they get good credit supply, good profit, then many of such factors can be overcome. Even socio-economic factors can be overcome and biophysical factors can also be overcome. These are in our hand. Only farmers need technology and the money to overcome these factors. 
Now, bridging the yield gaps, achieving the potential yield. Now, question comes, we have analyzed the yield gaps, how to bridge it, how to overcome these problems. So, therefore, to achieve yield potential requires perfection in the management of all other yield determining production factors such as plant population. This is just for an example, the supply and balance of 17 essential nutrients and protection against losses from insects, weeds and diseases from sowing to maturity. So, better crop management is, is a, of course an op option, taking the best of the seeds, taking the best of the irrigation methods and taking good supply of uh, uh, agrochemicals to control the insect pest and disease. So, we can manage or we can bridge this gap. Bridging this uh, yield gap is necessary and let us discuss how we can do it. Overcoming the abiotic stresses like water stress, soil fertility and health related constraints like climatic stresses and biotic stresses, insect pests and disease. So, there it is great opportunity to overcome many of these issues like water stresses, we can have two kind of water stresses, one can be the shortage of water and one can be excess of water. So, shortage of water can be bridged by increasing bring, uh, area under irrigation or changing the methods of irrigation. Switching over to micro irrigation can save water. Similarly, if you have excess water, then provision can be made to remove this water by drainage or by proper management of this water. Similarly, soil fertility related constraints, nutrient management can result in improvement in yield. Part of the nutrient management we will discuss today. Climatic stresses can be overcome by selecting the cultivar and adopting the technologies that suits to, to the adverse climatic conditions. Biotic stresses we need to see it in totality in a holistic way starting from crop rotations and preventive measures and and chemical me measures, bioagents, all sorts of integrated pest management strategies should be adopted. Then seed replacement and adoption of good agricultural practices. Uh, seed replacement means getting the, the good quality seed, uh, certified seed, replacing the farmer seed. Many times farmers use their own seed which should be replaced by some good quality seed or certified seed from time to time. This ratio is low, hardly 40 to 50 percent is the seed replacement ratio. For exact data, you can see website SeedNet, it is a government of India website where you can find seed, seed replacement rates. Overcoming the technological constraints, there are certain technical limitations in the crop production that should be overcome and infrastructure development includes your provision of roads to the farm cold storage and regular electricity supply and some other infrastructure related issues. Policy decisions like MSP, what is the change in MSP and what more needs to be done, this is in the hand of the government, but attractive prices should be there for the farmers. Now we restrict our discussion now to the nutrient management in diversified cropping system. If we want to narrow down this gap and increase the grain yield or yield of the crops and cropping system and at the same, same time we want to restore our fertility or make improvement in fertility then we need to do a, a nutrient management on cropping system basis. So nutrient management in diversified cropping system. So what will decide the nutrient management practices? So it is crops in the system, what kind of crop you are taking? how many crops are there and which variety is there. So far variety is concerned for hybrids and high yielding varieties, the nutrient requirement is high and management will, will be different from varieties which require less quantity of nutrient. What is the type? If it is cereal plant, then it will need more of nitrogen. If it is leguminous plant, it will need less of nitrogen. So type of crop also determines the kind of nutrient management practices or quantity of the nutrients. Sequential or intercropping, in sequential cropping you are growing one crop at a time. In intercropping you have some complex situation where you have two crops, one is the main crop which is base crop and one is intercrop. 
so should i apply nutrient as per requirement of the base crop or as per requirement of the inter crop or as per requirement of the both the crop so this uh, situation becomes very complex and recommendations are varying for different regions for different states so local recommendations should be adopted by the farmers sources and nature of nutrient supply available what kind of sources are available with us and what can be made available to use so in this case uh, for example if you have uh, organic manures like farmyard manure compost vermi compost then such manures will have residual effect or succeeding effect on the next crop and also the these will have cumulative effects over years if you are using them continuously for 5 10 years then these manures also have cumulative effect so these residual and cumulative effects of manure should be considered while making or formulating the fertilizer or nutrient recommendations irrigation facilities generally decides the quantity of fertilizer and timing of fertilizer in dry land areas or rain fed areas in general the quantity of nutrient required is less in irrigated area it is more generally we have interaction of nutrient and water so if you have sufficient water then you can use more nutrients however it depends upon kind of crop you have there are many study one such study suggests for mustard for example it can be grown in irrigated condition as well as in rain fed conditions so under irrigated condition the quantity of fertilizer could be higher than the rain fed condition soil type generally speaking sandy soils light light textured soils they require less quantity of nutrient uh, or rather more quantity of nutrient because nutrient losses are generally more in light textured soils or sandy soils so therefore here the nutrient requirement for a particular crop will be more than the heavy textured soils in general in heavy textured soils they can retain their cation exchange capacity is high and so on therefore losses of nutrients may be less compared to light textured soil therefore nutrient recommendation for heavy textured soil may be less for a particular crop now fertilizer use under multiple cropping systems so this was a report of an expert consultation held in new delhi long back but its recommendations are quite useful because after that very few recommendation came on this subject so now see recommendations of this uh, uh, meeting uh, rice based cropping systems so there can be two conditions for rice irrigated rice and rain fed rice so first we deal with irrigated rice so suppose it is rice wheat sequential cropping system where you have irrigation facility so for alluvial soils in the indian subcontinent nitrogen to be applied to both the crops phosphorus to be applied to wheat and potassium and zinc to be applied to rice so in rice you can see that phosphorus is not recommended phosphorus is recommended for wheat so in rice what happens it is irrigated rice and ph of the soil is neutralized when you continuously keep the water standing in the paddy field the, it changes the ph of the soil it brings uh, to neutrality or say around 6.5 to 7 whether your soil is fundamentally acidic or basic the ph will come around 6.5 to 7 so in that case phosphorus availability will be more the native phosphorus will be made available to the crop therefore no need to apply phosphorus for rice if you are managing nutrients on a cropping system basis rice rice mung bean or soybean sequential cropping system nitrogen to be applied to both the rice crops while phosphorus to be applied only to one preferably the second dry season crop rice crop together with potassium sulfur and zinc on the basis of soil test rice jute sequential cropping system so this uh, system is quite common in west bengal and in some parts of bihar so nitrogen to be applied to both crops phosphorus potassium sulfur and zinc if needed to be applied to jute now see recommendation for rain fed rice so rice chickpea rice lentil rice horse gram rice niger rice mustard rice linseed rice groundnut and rice soybean sequential system so you can see here under rain fed conditions after rice 
these oil seeds and pulses are grown and this system is common in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh and some other areas. So you can see under these cropping systems, nitrogen, phosphorus and other nutrients as required to be applied to rice crop. Only 20 kg P2O5 per hectare to be applied to the sequential legume crop if moisture conditions are favorable. Rice plus pigeon pea, it is uh, a system in Odisha or Bengal. Rice plus maize, rice plus cassava, rice plus cassava maybe in Kerala, rice plus leucina, leucocephala, and rice plus canaf intercropping system and nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium to be applied to the rice crop only and zinc and iron to be applied to rice when needed. Now after rice based cropping system, let us check nutrient management for maize based system. It is for two different areas, humid tropics and subhumid tropics. So in humid tropics, maize cowpea sequential system and maize plus cassava may and then maize plus groundnut and maize plus faciolus bean intercropping system and then maize plus grain cowpea LA cropping with leucina leucocephala and subhumid uh, tropics maize plus plus pigeon pea, maize plus soybean, maize plus cowpea and maize plus chickpea or safflower. Nitrogen to be applied to maize only, phosphorus to be applied to maize and associated legume However, potassium, sulfur and zinc to be applied to maize when needed as per requirement. So this is the recommendation for above systems. Now sorghum based cropping system for semi-arid tropics, sorghum plus pigeon pea, sorghum plus moong bean, sorghum plus cow pea and sorghum plus groundnut intercropping systems, sorghum yam and sorghum chickpea safflower sequential systems. So these systems are common in semi-arid tropics say Andhra Pradesh or Telangana states like that. So nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and sulphur and zinc to be applied to sorghum only. Now some strategies for allocation of fertilizer phosphorus in cropping system in India reported by Tandon 1993. So for example, uh, you have two or three crops in these systems, wheat, moong bean, pearl millet and you have just 60 kg phosphorus then this 60 kg applied to wheat only. If it is 90 kg, then 60 to wheat, 30 to moong bean and 30 to millet. If farmer has only 135 kg phosphorus, then 90 to wheat, 15 to moong bean and 30 to millet. Wheat pearl millet system, if it, a farmer has 75 kg, then 45 to wheat and 30 to millet. And 120 kg, 60 to wheat and 60 to millet. Like potato, wheat, rice, if 90 kg P2O5 is there, then 62 potato and 32 wheat. So likewise, the phosphorus is allocated to different cropping system, different crop in cropping system. See this example of integrated nutrient management packages and their comparison with fertilizer recommendations for rice wheat cropping system. So in this case, you can see uh, just I, I give you one example and transgenic uh, gangetic plane rice. 120 kg nitrogen, 60 kg phosphorus, 60 kg K2O and 20 kg zinc sulfate. So for rice, 60 kg nitrogen, 30 kg K2O and 20 tons per hectare phosphorus FYM on poultry manure. Likewise, there are many recommendations and under most of the situation, it is suggested that you go for integrated nutrient management practices. So overall, today you have seen different crops and cropping systems and yield gaps and where and how we can bridge, bridge the yield gaps and management of soil fertility should be of topmost priority and nutrient recommendations should be uh, based upon the cropping system basis. You have seen uh, some examples of nutrient recommendations for different cropping system and hope this lecture was useful to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.